Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Imhotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And we have with us today a very special guest, Mr. T. Owens Moore, PhD. Uh, he is a associate professor of psychology at Clark Atlanta University. And he's written a number of texts, including The Science of Melanin, uh, Pigment Power, and Dark Matters, Dark Secrets. We're going to get into his life, uh, his educational motivations, his academic motivations, and we want to know what he got going on for the near future. So all that and more when we return in just a second. like to welcome each and every one of you for joining this discussion today. And so always, uh, we are glad to have you here on the Nbongi. And before we get started, just a quick announcement. Uh, as you all know, on uh, August the 22nd, my new book will be released titled Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, towards an etymology of the place name Kemet. And maybe I should throw the thumbnail so it's better to see. Uh, you can order your copy today at the website, uh, asarimhotep.com. Actually, that is the email address, but um, the extension is still the same. But now we'll go with this one. So yeah, so www.asarimhotep.com is where you can currently uh, pre-order and it will be released everywhere on August the 22nd. So I'm happy about the text, just going through some last minute perusing and it will be ready for you on the 22nd. So uh, as mentioned earlier, we have a special guest with us today, uh, Dr. T. Owens Moore, and he's just going to give us a little bit about himself when he comes on. I met this uh, gentleman in Cleveland, Ohio. Recently, I came there to do a lecture and he was one of the featured lecturers as well, but just on the next day. So unfortunately, I was unable to view uh, or listen to his, his lecture live as my plane was leaving back to Philadelphia. Um, but we did get a chance to uh, chop it up, you know, prior to uh, his lecture. So uh, very, very knowledgeable brother. And I just had to have him on the program and introduce him to you all. So I'm very uh, proud and happy to welcome Dr. T. Owens Moore. How are you doing today? Sam? What's up, my brother? I'm doing well. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you uh, for agreeing and, of course, uh, for being here with us today. And um, so before we get started, you know, for those who are new to the Mbongi and don't know who you are, uh, can you give us a little bit of background of who you are, where you're from, and uh, how did you get into the field of psychology? Right. Well, basically, like you said, we did chop it up in Cleveland, uh, first, our first time meeting one another. It was, it was a beautiful conference because it's after the pandemic where people were not able to be in presence, you know, and, and be in the midst of uh, people to have a good conversation rather than dealing with the Zoom and the Zoom and the StreamYard and all these this technology. But as we chatted and rapped, 
we seem to have a lot of parallels and I really appreciate the, the fact that you are, I say a new Jack uh, revolutionary scholar, <laughs> making changes and making some waves. And uh, even with the title of your book, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, I mean, you now are putting it out there to give a different perspective on the research that you have looked at. Mm -hmm. So for me, as we've had discussions, I'm uh, from Pennsylvania, so I see you're living in Philadelphia. Right. So I'm from up north, but I'm living down south now. I uh, went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, and I got my bachelor's degree, actually my BS degree in psychology. My emphasis was in physiological psychology, studying the brain. I was going to go on to be a medical doctor or uh, somehow proceed on to studying the brain in a more intense level. So I decided to go on and get my PhD from Howard University my master's degree and my PhD from Howard University. And uh, from there, I had my first job as a uh, assistant professor at Morehouse College in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So I left Morehouse College, went across the street to Clark Atlanta University as associate professor. I uh, had done some uh, things over the years at Clark, and I actually left Clark and went to Fayetteville State University to be the chair person for the Department of Psychology at Fayetteville State. HBCU there in North Carolina. And then I returned back to uh, Clark to serve again as the chairperson for the Department of Psychology at Clark Atlanta University. Mm -hmm. With my background in education, I have had an opportunity to start or be one of the founding members of the Neuroscience Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, I had one of the first collaborative neurological sciences awards from NINDS. That stands for National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke. So I had one of the first CNS awards, Collaborative Neurological Science Award, to work along with Georgia State and an HBCU where I was at Morehouse, Morehouse School of Medicine in Clark. So in terms of the bench work and the lab work, I've done that for years. But as I've as I'm investigating the science, I'm also trying to investigate who we are as a people. So mm -hmm actually teach two classes, one called Physiological Psychology, the other is, the other is called African-Centered Psychology. So I get mm. a chance to have my balance to study our culture and our traditions and also looking at science. So in between that, there's a class like Health Psychology that could be a combination to put it all together. So for me, I've enjoyed the experience for 30 plus years uh, teaching. I now have a chance to be on a sabbatical to be away from the classroom so I can focus on more research. And I think when we were in Cleveland, I got a chance to share with you some of my books. And I have a book called The Science of Melanin. I wrote that actually in 1995. And mm -hmm. I wrote it with a uh, publisher named Beckham House Publishers. And he uh, sold the rights to someone else. And they're now marketing my book, and I don't really get a cut for that. So I now have chosen to market my own books. And that's why I'm, I'm proud of you. Uh, your book's being marketed by you? Yep. Right. Yes, indeed. So, yes. Got to take control of your work. So uh, after producing Science and Melanin, I wrote a book called Dark Matters, Dark Secrets. Mm -hmm. That was to go more into the brain, uh, drug addiction, and talk about some more like social, social commentary on what's going on in the world. I actually think of addiction as a disease, but how melanin as a complex scientific element can absorb things. So you think about how drugs may be impacting people differently when you speak about ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So then I wrote a, another book called uh, Why Darkness Matters, and I wrote that along with some other authors. This is now the newest version, but I wrote it with Edward Bruce Bynum. I don't know if you've read his book called African Unconscious. Mm -mm. Uh, I got to know Bruce Bynum's work. Yeah. Uh, Dark Light Unconscious. I mean, he, his brother's a clinical psychologist, but he's on that level of uh, breaking down what you're looking at when you go to Kemet, when you study uh, Egyptology. So he, uh, he along with Ann Brown, she's a biochemist out of New York. She's retired now, but she was at Megan Evers College for several years in the biology department. And may his soul rest in peace. The other author was Dr. Richard King. I'm mm. sure you know Dr. Richard King's work because he's been a, a stalwart and very um, monumental with his work to talk about pineal gland and the mental nerve tract and so it was just an honor to be on that book with them uh and so we just got that republished we had it with uh african-american images out of chicago with juanza kunjufu and so mm. keeping our work 
uh, alive is very important. And in the last book, I think you had, as you have the title of this project here, Pigment Power. Mm -hmm. You know, the top is on Melon the Science Self, which you wanted to talk about today. Yes. And um, yes, I was uh, blessed enough to be gifted uh, a number of his books. And so this is this is the one I've been reading. And so um, so I don't, I don't have any detailed questions for the other text. So that's why I just chose it. Yeah. We can jump no and, and go into any any of the other texts. Yeah. So uh, I want to say thank you again uh, for that. And and so it seems as if, you know, when we're looking at the theme of the or, or at least a, a an underlying current in in all of your text is the presence and a description and the function of of melanin. And so uh, I want to ask first and foremost, you know, how out of you know all of the things dealing with psychology did you get interested in that particular uh subject right. and and what would have you learned as a result you know of, of diving into that and what are some misconceptions you know out there about this concept of melanin is well? right well when we first met and as you were describing to me also your critical analysis of things uh that's where i was with the topic of melanin uh, you're you're critiquing people in their use of the word kemet and the, uh, <laughs> the presence of african people or how we've been in other parts of the world so you're critically analyzing the works of others so i was doing the same thing with the melanin component so in the science mm -hmm. of melanin i have an article in there or chapter on the critical analysis of the black authors that have talked about this and it's just not talking bad about anybody it's about critiquing the work so we now know a little bit better because if you mm -hmm. think about it when we speak about melanin we think of pigment and skin and darkness yeah. but that has absolutely nothing to do with the brain hmm. it's the brain that does the behavioral uh manipulations and the analysis of the world so it's not the skin so that means melanin we got to start understanding a little bit better but guess so guess what there's melanin inside the brain you know, our mm -hmm. eyes are dark in color. There's melanin in our eyes and our organs. So now when we start to break it down in terms of the way it operates and functions, you take it away from the misconceptions about skin color and melanin because, you know, mm -hmm. you start to they said black people are dark and so all black people can dance or act the same way. It's like, no, it's like, it's not because of your skin color. It's how the brain operates. So since I study the brain, that's why I delved into the topic of discussion. Indeed. And you mentioned earlier at the beginning the the role of melanin or the possibility of the role of melanin in terms of addiction in terms of drugs and the like and so how what, what have you found out in in terms of that research yeah uh, well i mean what we're talking about melanin is an absorber of energy so anything that's black absorbs. If it's white, it reflects. So on a scientific level, if you think about the chemicals that are carbon-based uh, that are, are out there, you also have neurotransmitters in your brain that are carbon-based. So the melanin attracts those chemicals in the brain and actually it's doing it to prevent toxicity. If you think about it, you don't die of natural causes. You die of toxicity over time. So mm. the body can no longer what re replenish itself and take care of itself because it's now beat up and tired and you think about those areas of the brain that are continually getting from the nicotine cocaine to the methamphetamines to alcohol as that's continually circulating in the brain the brain's doing what it can to compensate to keep it fresh but then it absorbs so much toxicity it doesn't mm. operate anymore properly and you really could see it in in disorders like uh uh, you ever heard of Parkinson's disease? Yes. Yeah, so Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder. You don't usually see that in young people. It happens in older ages. So it's happening in older ages, older ages because, again, over long-term effects, the brain is no longer able to compensate and, and thwart off those toxic elements that are circulating in the brain. So when you think about drug addiction, if melanin is highly 
uh, attractive, you think about there's certain drugs that may be more, um, not so much compatible, but effective and efficacious for some ethnicities versus others. There's a book by uh, Wallace Terry called Bloods. If you ever read mm -hmm. that book, he's talking about the mm -hmm. oral history of black Vietnam veterans. And oh, talking yeah. about how- Oh, I remember that text. Yeah, they're all in the same experience, but the brothers are like doing marijuana to chill them out. The white people are like mm -hmm. doing amphetamine to hype them up, but they're all in the same mm -hmm. scenario, the same environment that is vicious. I mean, I haven't been in war. I haven't seen bodies get blown up and killed and all that. But in that same environment, two different ethnicities needing different types of external agents to kind of deal with that mess. So again, on the level of melanin, being different you think about the uh, false positives of drug tests some people who are they could be taking robitussin or some other kind of or nyquil and they go take a drug test and they say you're gonna be doing cocaine or something hmm. so the elements that are in some of the uh, foreign agents to put in your body and then people doing drug testing and with the dark hair if you're taking the drug testing from your hair the melanin absorbed absorbed it absorbs those chemicals so therefore you have now false positives in drug testing. So there's a whole lot of data that we need to kind of put in perspective because we're not all the same. Well, that, that was going to be my next question. You know, is, is, is there, since we're not just dealing with the, I guess is what it's the eumelanin of the, of the yeah, skin. Eumelanin skin. Yes. Yeah. Neuromelanin um, in the brain. Is there a difference, a fundamental difference depending on populations on the amount and the overall effect of the the neuromelanins um across you know different different regions uh of people around the world that's an excellent question certainly we can't uh in a finite manner say that a certain group in india a certain group of people in ireland certain people mm -hmm. in the united states have a dramatically different uh, operation in terms of how that neuromelanin works, but we know uh, in terms of diseases and disorders, certain people get certain disorders more than others. And so you start to track down to certain brain areas that may be impacted, you may be able to start answering those questions. There's a uh, significant data going on right now about people who do methamphetamines and a combination of cocaine and other drugs. They're, they're sent substantia nigra, that is the place in the brain, substantia mm -hmm. substance nigra black, that is where the neuromelanin is for producing dopamine. There's other mm -hmm. neuromelanated centers, but, but for this one in particular, they say it's larger. They do this like transonal um, like, uh, graphing of the brain, and they're saying that it's larger in those people who are doing those types of drugs. So I think it's like it's because it's getting, it's getting inflamed. It looks like it's larger, but it's inflamed because those people are doing those drugs are highly likely to get heart disease when they get older. So mm. people who work in uh, in farms and around the pesticides, a lot of those uh, farmer work, those workers, they're, they're also subjected to having heart disease and those types of um, neurotoxic, deadly uh, ailments because they're around those chemicals all the time. So the more protective you have of that melanin working throughout your body, the less likely you are to succumb and when we think about we say eul melanin this eu melanin that you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. the reason why people of african descent or melanin dominated people look much younger than others because that melanin is preventing that toxicity from around in the world from destroying those cells not just externally but also internally mm -hmm. so that's why we look, look much younger and much fit than other people because of that melanin well, you, you have a uh, chapter here, chapter 12 of uh, Pigment Power, and um, it's titled Pigment Power Defense System, which right. seems to be um, a little bit of what you're talking about now. So can you tell us uh, a little bit of what's going on in, in that chapter? And, and, Absolutely. Uh, so the ahead. book was actually finished in 20. 20 before the pandemic really hit and then when the pandemic was going on i said i gotta add this chapter on the mm -hmm. power defense system because you're not immune to anything it's mm -hmm. that's straight you don't have a immune system you have a defense mechanism system so when we start looking at 
interpreting how science is, history is, and start putting things in perspective, guess what? You have a different way of seeing the world. So we have a in, we have a defense mechanism system. So the stronger your defense is, you can fight anything. The weaker right. it is, guess what? You're going to succumb to things. So by the big push on saying take it as this experimental agent, it's going to help you fight this particular uh, coronavirus that's out there. I mean, viruses are everywhere. It's probably more viruses than our people. You go up there in the atmosphere, the stratosphere, and all these other places, viruses are everywhere. So this coronavirus that they said had a specific latch that got into your cells. The latch was on this chemical or this, this receptor area called ACE. So rather than making it too complex for you, ACE stands for angel tension converting enzyme. It's a space that this hook got in and it got into the cell. Guess what? This ACE is everywhere in your body, in your lungs, your heart, your brain, especially in the nasal passages. So it makes sense how then this this foreign agent was able to kind of neutralize a lot of people's health. But the greater and the more impactful your health is on the front end, you can fight this. And you know, the people who are being impacted yeah. primarily from uh, the early onslaught, obese on drugs or let me say on drugs like high blood pressure medicines mm -hmm. uh diabetes uh, poor health so when we say a defense mechanism system we're saying there's so many things that can be done and even with the melanin serving as a uh neutralizer of toxic substances it's serving and you, it, and you can see it with africa africa didn't yeah. succumb as much as other uh continents you know so yeah. you're looking at and I did an article on that with a brother named uh, Niana Rossian. We published an article in, I think, the Journal of Social and Behavioral Health about, and this is before all the studies came out, that Africa did not succumb. And I'm saying that mm. because melanin serves as a defense mechanism system. Mm. Well, you dealing with the health, do you have a um, chapter seven, which is very interesting, is titled Penis Power in pigmentation you know virility and no sterility so so how does how does this all relate to our sexual health right so when we say penis power uh if we think about us as Af as people just in general when we used to walk mm -hmm. around the earth we didn't have all these clothes on you know we don't yeah. buy jeans and you know that we were just living in nature and as the sun was beaming on us we were being uh radiated but I'm certain the lo there were some loin cloths covering the uh, internal areas. So we, as we think about today, when you look at your uh, internal, your genitals, they're darker than other parts of the body. Well, how could that be when they're not getting any sunlight? Hmm. So that melanin is serving a very important process to maintain life and to ensure that there's uh, like energy in that area for what absorbing energy. So the melanated areas in our body are triggering places for what generating energy so the power as i talked about at the end of that chapter is on um beets mm -hmm. so you like beets i don't like the taste but i know um uh, that it's important to see like i have uh on the verge or at times i have high blood pressure so it's, mm -hmm. it's been recommended that you know i consume a lot of beet and beet products you know to to facilitate that process you know have you ever, uh, have you ever like, cooked the beet like done it yourself i I'm, I'm i'm working on it uh you know right now i can only take it in like liquid forms okay and and or um pickle beets say? you only know, like pickle like, beets yeah it, it, it's something about the taste. It's, it's just oh. I'm, I'm just trying to get past the taste, yeah. and uh, but but I, I I will consume it. But it has to be kind of like fine in a mix of things or like in juice form. But this is this is relatively recent in terms of me consuming yeah. beets. Well, the reason why I'm saying is because if you actually boil the beet and had to work with it, man, the pigmentation is everywhere. It's like get all yeah. your kitchen and your stain. So you just think about the power of the pigment. In that food item and then as it's circulating in your body so uh you heard of something called viagra mm -hmm. viagra is a uh so-called male enhancement medication and they didn't find out that it was used for 
uh, penile erections because it was a side effect from blood pressure medicines. Yeah. Okay, so Viagra <laughs> was used originally for blood pressure. Side effect was erections. So that focuses on the blood pressure or the cardiovascular system. Well, beets yeah. can do the same thing, but not on your cardiovascular, on your nervous system. Mm. So the power of beets and what's in it, I'm just saying it, it's magnificent. And so from the power, the powder, um, I guess beet juice, you know, make that. I don't mind eating it. It tastes fine. I, mean, I didn't like it as a kid. Yeah. I didn't like beets, you know. But I'm just saying right now, the power of pigmentation and, again, the penis being dark in color when it's not even receiving light, there's science to that. And we now know mm. that, again, products like Amarud or Beet are now natural products that can be used as, like, aphrodisiacs or, again, stimulating uh, male enhancement versus having this external chemical called Viagra that's probably not good in the long run. Indeed. Um I want to know, because I'm, I'm trying to remember, and, and maybe you can speak to this, if it is because of our melanin, or like for, for Black people in general, uh, that we have a hard time producing natural vitamin D, or that we do produce vitamin D. Uh, but I know that there's some deficiency because we because we absorb most of the energy that it is we we uh, it doesn't produce something like and, and there's a like a, a health risk for for yeah. us because of like this is one of the 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 few um, not side effects but I guess you know unintended. Uh, problems of having you know saying rich melanin I don't know, i'm trying to remember i should have looked this up before that right uh, well well rather than getting too technical with some of the names because the vitamin d really is not in the vitamin the steroid hormone hmm. you start looking at the conversions of it, it must break down in the body from the sun or for it to now be effective going through your kidneys and liver and then get to your cells so it gets very complex so hmm. rather than saying vitamin d i call it sultriol and that's from some scientists from north carolina stump and pervet they kind of created this name called sultriol uh, early on in like, like the 1980s so the importance of vitamin d historically is that it's the source in my opinion that creates the defense mechanism defense mechanism system to be so strong and i'm going to flip this mm -hmm. question back around to you because we're going to deal with identity mm -hmm. Uh, right. So when we were, again, walking the earth thousands of years ago, we were open in, in the sun. So that's what humans are, hue in the man, woman. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what the, the, the importance of this external body we have is to protect us from the radiation. So as we then move further away from the equator and start exploring the world, the melanin becomes a problem. It's now mm -hmm. a a, a uh, detriment because there's no longer as much sun shining anymore. Therefore, the body can't produce that vitamin D or that social as much anymore. Therefore, some problems can result. If you're a dark person living in a uh, place that's very dank and cloudy, guess what? Mm -hmm. You can get rickets. What is rickets? Yeah. Bone deformity. And I break that down in the science of melanin because I support Shaken Diop's perspective about the Grimaldi man. It's proof. Mm -hmm. That the change from the African going up to the Europe when they got stuck there in those caves and then now they're living in a cave where there definitely is no sun, those fossil lines have rickets. That becomes what? Because of a deficiency in, in the vitamin D. Now, that's 40,000 years ago. But let's go yeah. down to the time of Kemet and your book called Race and Identity. If you look on the front of, uh, I think, Egypt Revisited, and even in uh, Dr. Shaken Dev's book, there's a mural with like black, uh, Asian, uh, Euro, mm -hmm. Indo European. So you see those images, and they have like uh, the uh, African attire on. Yeah. They have all different visual appearances, right? Yeah. So in the past, it was not really a concern about black, white, yellow. They, they didn't really, in my opinion, look mm -hmm. at that as some. Uh, deficiency or look at people as uh, or as a problem that started to happen when white people started to be into colonialism and trying to control the world but I think originally this issue of identity there in the Kemet 
I don't think they were dealing with these issues. No, they they they, they weren't. And and the the problem that we have in modern times is that we we don't like to differentiate the circumstances that we exist in today in terms of politics, in terms of culture, and in recent history. Um, and that and thousands, you know, of years ago in any particular place in the in the world. And so we're thinking that, you know, to a certain extent, there's a level that, you know, all human beings experience the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond whatever that limit is, um, there's there's a certain context in a way that people be that is not the same today as it was back then yeah. you know like um and so like you know because we don't live and depend for example on a river like our culture our identity is not centered around living on the river and fishing and and in being amongst you know for example these large predators uh mm -hmm. and animals and stuff like this like most of us don't live in an environment like that. So we tend to forget that when we're looking at ancient Kemet uh, and, and how they saw things in their perspectives versus, you know, today, where just as you mentioned, you know, this colonial effort and they needed a reason to justify enslavement and this division into, you know, biological races and, and, and all this other kind of stuff. But yeah, I agree. So, so as you as you do that as a historian for you, yeah. so when the Greeks were coming in, because they're only they, Greeks were like 640 to 322 BC, a thousand mm -hmm. years before that, Africans were doing things without these foreigners coming in. Yeah, you had Hyksos invasions, right? You had these mm -hmm. Indo -Europe, Europeans, might have been lighter in color, looking like maybe the Arabs or people that are in that Asian area today. But what was the, I mean, we know what it was the 14th dynasty, right? Where the uh Hyksos came in and and took over for years until we got back on tap top mm -hmm. 18th dynasty got back on top but still what was the mentality when we saw them first yeah and, and that's a a good question so what i haven't found in in my research is this like like this overwhelming or even a single example of the egyptians referring to these people mm -hmm. in terms of their skin color now it's the exact opposite when you um, start reading the greek writings about the egyptians so you know for those who are just encountering the egyptians they were so different from the the europeans that they were used to that their color and hair texture in, in size, even in many respects, was was worthy enough to note in history. Like when you come here, you're going to see people that look like this, you know, with they were black with curly hair and these bony legs mm -hmm. and, and stuff like this. So you you consistently see, but you don't see that in the reverse of the Egyptians describing, although you may see. Yeah, that actual description in the the drawings, like the one that you you mentioned um, earlier, the so called table of the nations that you find in various tombs, mm -hmm. uh, like in Ramesses the Third's tomb. Um, How about the term Tamahu? T A M U. It doesn't mean white, and I know certain people that that try to translate it to mean as such. And this is what I mean, it's kind of anachronistic. It's just like when the Egyptologists, when you look at the earliest dictionaries, you'll see the words for like Nehesi. Mm -hmm. And in the definition, they'll say Negroes. Mm -hmm. But there was no Negroes first and foremost during right. this time. And, and so they wouldn't see, it's kind of a double thing because they're trying to say that these were the black people, the ones south of Egypt, versus the Egyptians who were quote unquote white in their eyes. Mm -hmm. And and so they just try to use this as a blanket term. It's anachronistic in terms of uh, and it's a modern, you know, kind of racial 
thing that they were trying to impose on the ancient Egyptians and then putting it into the text. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, and so that's kind of the, the same thing that a lot of us have kind of done in a reverse with the so-called Tamahu, which is supposed to be like the Libyans mm -hmm. uh, or whatnot, or, or, or like light-skinned Berbers. Yeah. Uh, and so, but it, it, the word in itself in Egyptian does not mean white. If they want to say white, they would say like hedget, which is uh, mm -hmm. comes from a root hedge, meaning to shine and light. Yeah. And the thing is, um, I, I actually got that from uh, Wayne Chandler's work in, I think, African presence in early Europe, it advised mm -hmm. African certain one other and i think he made that in egypt visited too seen the term but for african people let's stay with us psychologically for us being a people who love color and are part of nature and then to see this external individual come in that's lacking that color there may have been some bewilderment but the other side the reverse of those who lack it mm. was where the intensity on division was because they mm. feared their body so much and here you are now openly showing your breast perhaps even mm -hmm. showing your penis perhaps showing your whole body with color and you lack that oh my goodness the reverse of that is what dr wellsing has talked about for years like the reaction formation you're now changing and switching switching something up that is good and saying it's bad like your color so mm -hmm. here we are open with with our skin exposed but they were scared to show their body and that's why when they, these European and the colonizers went to the islands and saw the natives, oh, they're savages. They don't have any clothes yeah. on them. So because they worried about their bodies and showing their white skin and being exposed and fearing inferior. So they refer, reversed it, made it like everybody else is problematic. And I'm saying that because as I travel the world and just see different peoples in different cultures now, and it's like it's just an interesting discussion about the variation. Europeans take it to a whole nother level of yeah. derision and 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 problems and negativity and that's not how i see that so initially i'm saying when these people were coming down we, we were so accepting we're so accepting of people we're so loving yeah after chancellor williams and the structural black civilization so we could have taken them out a long time ago but we're so loving that we just take them into our homes and guess what now we see the uh, uh manipulations of history and how this fear of their bodies in my opinion, has created a problem, but I don't think African people dealt with that when they first confronted them. No, not on that level. But it's not to say that they did not recognize uh, skin color and variation. Like when you yeah. you read the hymn to Aten, you know, he talks about Aten uh, putting everybody in their respective places, like creating man and putting different um uh, people and and where they find themselves and with their different speeches so they're recognizing different languages and their different skin colors mm -hmm. you know but what you don't find is a label that a group of people can be identified by their skin color and that's the that's one of the fundamental differences and so you 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 even see this reflected back on um the even how they identify themselves because you know this is this is the argument that shekhan the diop made that the word kemet itself comes from a root kim that means black and then thus kemet means the land of the black people but there's there's no evidence that they they looked at their knowledge of the variation of human skin tones as a basis for identification mm -hmm. either for themselves or for um other folks and it's interesting because when they depicted themselves they primarily depicted themselves in a color called desher which is red like red or reddish brown mm -hmm. and and it's interesting that this is the exactly the same color that they always depict the sun. Right. And in even the, the king being the Sara, being the son of the sun, you know, they 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 may have seen a correlation between their skin color in relation to the sun. Now, when they wouldn't have, of course, this deep melanin uh, you know, analysis and, and, and knowledge, but 
there, there's something there worthy to explore. So okay. African scholar, why was Osiris green? Because Osiris is the personification of various different um, things in ancient Egyptian society. So, but first and foremost, outside of his association with kingship and death, because he's the ruler of the underworld, he is also the personification of the Nile River. And this is a this is something that I discuss in the text on uh, on the chapter when I'm dealing with the the 049 glyph. And um, the the 049 glyph, let me see if I know I don't have something readily available, but um, the 049 glyph is the, the, when you see the word Kemet and you'll see like the little circle with an X in the center that denotes a, a city, you know, or a village or occupied uh, place. Um, it comes in various colors, but what people don't know is that the Nile River is many colors throughout the year. And so it has its normal color. It is also blue. And you'll see certain depictions of the newt symbol with the, with the blue in it. It is also red and reddish brown because of certain minerals that, that are accumulated. And I, and I believe that this is really the origin of the, uh, the Semitic, the Hebrew mythology about the king, um, excuse me, God or Yahweh defeating the Pharaoh's army and and um, and the whole things of Moses and, and turning the, the Nile River into to blood. But it wasn't blood. It just turned red naturally because of the the these deposits, these minerals. It, it's black because of when the, the black soil is is uh on on the top layer you know of the um of the river during the inundation period but it is also green because yeah. of, of a lot of algae and stuff and so like this is documented from from time on so what you'll see is these different variations of osir in these different colors because these are representative of these different phases of the now okay. and uh so but yeah, that's, that's well, let, me, to you. let me throw something esoterically to you and then also uh -huh. talk about climate change today. One is, OK, so we might have been lighter and green in color way mm -hmm. back, but we started rusting out because, you know, when when like, like, a, like a piece of iron, if you keep uh -huh. it out there in the in the uh, sun, in the in the in the water and it's going to rust out. So our mm -hmm. bodies, you know, may Maybe Cyrus is reflecting that we were lighter in color like that, like nature, like chlorophyll, mm. which is a pigment. Number two is, is I was actually in um in the uh, Pacific Coast in a country last week. Oh, my goodness. I didn't want to get in the water because it was brown. Why? Mm. Because of a big storm. Next day, storm went away. The water was green. That's right. You're right. Mm -hmm. Most of the environment, <laughs> the water can change. And so without a question, speaking of how they looked at the Nile and that whole Nile Valley living is much yeah. different than other parts of Africa and other parts of the world. Because exactly. we know that Africa had black people, but there also were then people who had you know, mutations. And so albinos didn't form and then lighter people didn't form and they start staying together. And so then they then move out. The issue is, what was the reflection of those African people all over the continent towards these lighter people? There's bad stories about down in Tanzania, right? Uh -huh. About them not not acknowledging the al albinos properly, right? Yeah. There's stories about them being um, uh, abused. Uh -huh. I mean, so we know that all African people and all African countries may not have the same perspectives on how things are operating. But in general, yeah. I'm just saying we don't function in exclu exclusivity. We usually focus on you know the commonality. Yeah, that, that's a that's a you bring up a, a, a salient point regarding although there are great commonalities between African people, there are some significant differences between uh, population groups like you can be in Nigeria, you know, um, among the Igbo people. The birth of twins was seen mm -hmm. as a bad thing and an omen. 
And they used to kill twins because of this belief that these twins were bad omens. Well, you know, 50 feet away from the Igbo is the Yoruba people. Mm -hmm. And for Yoruba people, twins are a blessing. They are a, a, a sign of um, prosperity and, and it, is, it is seen as a, a, uh, a good thing to, mm -hmm. to have twins. And so they're, they're neighbors and have these two totally different perspectives on the concept yeah. of, of, of twins. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, uh, and I know. I, I'll go ahead. In, uh, in uh, Nigeria, Oweri, uh -huh. 2008, I gave a presentation on phytoestrogens and their impact on behavior. So mm -hmm. why am I saying this? So I'm breaking it down as a physiological psychologist. You just talking about the history component about the, the cultures living next next to one another. But as I'm reporting and talking about phytoestrogens are natural soy based products. Mm -hmm. So I study animal and the, and the animals in the laboratory to manipulate behavior to see what's going on in the brain. So the phytoestrogens come from soy products. So mm -hmm. you heard about this guy named Usain Bolt, right? Yeah. He was the fastest man in the world. He says, coming from Jamaica, what made him fast, he's just, I don't know if he's teasing about it, being serious about it, but he says eating yams. Mm. So when you go to Ibu land, when you go to that part of Nigeria, close to where I was at Oweri, guess what they eat a lot of? Yams. So it makes right. sense how it alters the reproductive capabilities of people. You have more twins being developed. It's because of the environment yeah. and the foods that they're eating. Mm. So people don't really break it down like that, but I'm just saying... When we start thinking about, oh, people are cursed because of their color or cursed because they got twins. No, it comes down to the biology that created Man. that scenario. Indeed. And um, so, yeah, the uh, I wanted to go back to that 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 notion of, you know, we were possibly lighter. Like when I when I look at. Uh, because you, you have a chapter in here on evolution and, and, and melanin and stuff like this. And so, like, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, we know that, uh, you know, we share ancestry with, you know, the other great apes uh, that, that, you know, are primarily found on the continent of Africa. But, of course, orangutans can be found in Asia. And... Um, and when you look at the skin underneath the fur, because we're the quote unquote hairless apes, right? So we, we, we've lost a lot um, in terms of the thickness. We still have it, of course, we can see, you know, on our, on our bodies, the, the presence of hair, but it's not that super big, thick coat. That's what you it's, say. Go ahead. Go ahead. Continue on. <laughs> but when you, when you look underneath that, um, the the furs and things the the skin is very light right. you know and then of course the the less skin the less hair we have is the more exposure to the sun we would expect it you know especially with glogar laws uh as shekhan's diop you know would mention you know uh being close to the equator that our our skin will reflect you know that that exposure to the uh to the to the sun well, two discussions. One is uh -huh. the fact and the reality that, well, did we come from apes? So some may have, some may not have. So the reality mm -hmm. is when you talk about the skin color, yeah, you take away that fur on that chimpanzee, that gorilla, orangutan, it's lighter in color. Well, I'm not saying that we were born as light people because on Africa with that sun shining, yes, you're going to be dark. The greatest, and then the other thing is the greatest variation mm -hmm. between people is there on that African continent. Yeah, more varied than this say a person that's from Africa than somebody in Europe. So the variation that we create, some could have been very light, some were very dark, but as we mixed and mingled, it created a more of an even skin tone that most people have. But this variation is on Africa in terms of the what mm -hmm. color of people. So you know, I have a chapter in the book where I talk about this book called Blacks A Race from Beyond the Stars. Mm -hmm. If you read that yet, not yet, no. So I have a book in there. No, I have a comment about a book written by Paul Duncan called 
blacks a race from beyond the stars. Why am I mentioning this to you? Because you, you can't go on the internet. You can't go on the internet find anything about the book. Hmm. Now I have a copy of the book. I talk about it in the book, but you can't go to the internet and find that book. Is this in the chapter chapter eleven, the astrobiology? Probably. Yeah. yeah. So I haven't, so, I haven't gotten deep into that part yet. All right, but all I'm saying to you is that uh -huh. that reality of what is what it really is origins. Where did we really come from? What is that moon? Is that really a satellite up there? I mean, what is what's going on with how we then look at the origins of people in general? And the fact that we keep going back to Lucy 3.5 million years ago and yeah. there's some things going on before Lucy. I mean, <laughs> I just saw a movie called 65 million years ago. They put it on with, I think, Adam Driver, a uh, mm -hmm. white guy who from another planet, another system that came on down and he was like on a spaceship had some people that were on there, but they all died. So they're looking at 65 million years ago, people from another planet came down when the dinosaurs were here. It's just a <laughs> movie, but guess what? There were probably other civilizations that had more advanced technology than we have today. We don't put that in perspective. Uh, Chueto Ejiofor played in a movie called, not a movie, but a series called uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it? Um... It's an older film, I think done by uh, one of those. They, uh, uh, they redid it. Yeah. Yeah. But he's okay. a black man coming down from another area of the planet and yeah. trying to learn the language here. But he's looking for this vision, this super, this, this like energy source that can light up everything without electricity. So now they're trying yeah. to exploit his technology. The point is, I don't know about this ape story. Some people. Well, it would have to. It, it would have to go beyond like like i've never been um in, in terms of the debates like for some reason they just have a real big problem with with being connected to apes and and for me i think the ape should be more insulted uh being connected to us than hey. us to them that's just just my person personal opinion but okay. When we understand the evolutionary chain, like like when you read the book, you know your inner fish, and and how the uh, they talk about the evolution of, of the 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 fish or whatnot, and coming on land, and you know how some you know have went back in, like the whales, and you know the uh, what do you call them uh, sea. Like See organs and all that, and yeah, uh, seals. That's what I was looking for. Um, and so, like, when you look at the longer chain, you know, it, it, it's way beyond the in, in terms of the the biology and evolutionary discussion. It's way beyond you know the 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 apes, and so they're just so hung up on the apes. I'm like, that's. Yeah. way farther in the future than what the discussion is in the scientific text in terms of the the evolution and us coming out of the sea and then of course you you know you examine the, the nature of the bones and and all of that uh into it and so and i don't know why there's like such an emphasis that you know we we just need i think what underlies that is this need to feel created by a mm -hmm. creator and and not um evolving from you know some other thing and so that's what's what's interesting is uh to a certain extent you find evolutionary thought in ancient egypt not to the extent of natural selection as as you know we would do today but because god is seen as existence itself and it is an infinite existence nothing can exist outside of the existence so everything evolves and transforms from this primordial matter you know and, and it's first starting with the deities then they you know evolve into like the planets and, and stars like this and then they evolve into people and the animals like you see that uh, but they don't give you no lines like they're not saying that we're related nah. to apes and all that other kind of stuff right. but the the fundamental framework is there and so, you know, uh, I don't know. That's something I'm still, you know, well, we have a lot of connections to the worm. Arm. Our genetics yeah. have a lot of connections to the worm too. So I mean, I, it's just hard call. 
it's, a, it's further discussion on this debate about what we are connected to, where we really came from. It's not a simple discussion. And our ancient African ancestors, what out of the waters of Ptah rose the what? No, out of the waters of none rose Ptah, right? And mm -hmm. Ra came on down, and that whole issue of atom, A T O U A T U M A D A M, all that's connected. So they were conceptualizing these things. But like you said, the ape stories wasn't talked about back then. Nah, I'm not even sure they even outside of certain, you know, uh, monkeys that were existing there. Like you don't see any depictions of like gorillas. So we know that they they weren't that deep in the Central Africa in terms of right. their uh, their explorations. Basically, um, baboons. That was the main thing. Yeah, exactly. It it's just baboons, and you you see that all along. Well, at least back then, I don't think I've seen any baboons any time that I went to Egypt. So I don't even know if they're really still right. there like that. But you see them, of course, along in India and um, and then in East Africa. Mm -hmm. They have some in West Africa too, I believe. Yeah, they do have some in West Africa. Uh, but, you know, like bonobos, there's there's no the depictions of, of, of them. And, you know, there's no depictions of tigers. So they weren't that deep into Asia. Yeah. Uh, and with, with archaeology, we're going to keep finding more fossil lines. Yeah. And, uh, in, in Chad, they found a fossil line in seven million years ago. Seven million years ago called uh, they called it Tume. Yeah. T-O-U-M-A-I. I mean, we're gonna they're gonna keep on finding different fossil lines and saying that led to the human line, and the jury will never be out. But that's that's something that we as laypersons really have to kind of understand about the scientific process. That you know, anytime that we're having a discussion about biology and history, it's is well, this is what we you know, accept as as fact up to this date. Mm -hmm. This is what the, you know, the evidence allows for us to say. But tomorrow, you know, mm -hmm. we may find, for example, the spaceship that landed, you know, in like like I've always had that idea just for a story, mm -hmm. uh, just just as a kind of a film. Um, and, and others have explored that that thing. Uh, I forgot it, it's a uh what was it the was it the the event have you ever seen a show called the event i don't think so it was a it was a weekly television show that would come on in the 210s i believe and it was short run but the the idea was that uh humans were a a race ultimately like this is one of the the things that was revealed later on in the show that these the who we're calling humans were actually aliens who crash landed here mm -hmm. and and um so the part of the original group had come to retake back earth uh, but of course they're all white people because you know they they believe they exist even all across the, the galaxy uh, but it was an interesting take on on the idea of you know well maybe we are the aliens yeah you know? that's deep because how could we you, you mentioned evolve how could we evolve when we now deal with nuclear weapons and killing one another we got a war going on right now where we might not even be here next week because some crazy <laughs> that ain't evolving it's devolved well, I don't think that it is is done in a way that you know, as you know, uh like there's a goal in mind. Like I always ask this question in the infinite universe, what is progress? You know, like it is a it's almost a non concept, it's only adaptation. And yeah. you would actually have to have the 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 survival traits already, you know, um because that's something that you know we don't talk about is that there's just natural mutations some of them beneficial some of them not so beneficial depending upon what environment that you are in or what e events have uh, happened uh you know over the past and so people are thinking that like there's this conscious goal uh for for 
for organisms to evolve into. And it's not necessarily the case. Well, I would say as we're dealing with this, with a goal in mind, it should be, and, and this is the Mbangi, right? Mbangi yeah. means we're having a discussion about these real these real events, yeah. is the ultimate nature of, a, of collectivity. All organizations or all civilizations have worked in a collective manner. So if you're not yeah. thinking to work together, which all cells do, which all biological entities do, which then means the human experience should be. So if you're not working for a collectivity, you don't exist. Yeah, I think that's something, and I have this discussion all the time, that going back to this concept of Ma'at, which we all know is kind of like the, the central framework and governing paradigm of ancient Kemet. When I did my linguistic analysis, the the what I discovered is that you know what how we whatever we're pronouncing in terms of ma'at it derives from a root meaning to share food mm -hmm. and you know the the ancestors knew that you know unless we were able to work together we could not survive against you know these other other predators that have existed and evolved to have more natural abilities in terms of hunting their prey than we do right and you know we we kind of lost the sense of being able to for our own survival being able to uh collectively work together and share amongst each other uh, so that you know we can survive into the future let me, I, I know we have a lot of time, but I do have this one particular point to make because as a historian, perhaps you could also respond to that. But genetically speaking, so I'm studying now in, uh, epigenetics, looking at how trauma can have an impact on long term behavior. So I read a book by an Irish, uh, I think her name was Keneally, but it's dealing with the history of uh, genetics. And it's talking mm -hmm. about in Africa, raising the question. There's one guy from Benin. Mm -hmm. They don't trust one another in Benin. Mm. So he's looking at historically, why does that happen? So he's now got this Asian uh, colleague who's also looking at, well, is it the backwardness of these African countries that cause them to be exploited and then been taken to slavery? So when they're doing this investigation, they're looking at the issue of this trust factor that, you know, you sold me, your parents sold me, You're, I don't trust you. So now that yeah. goes long term in terms of black culture and people not trusting one another. But the deep part of it is those places in the research they found, one's the economist, the other is uh, this deal with behavioral analysis. Those African countries and civilizations and places that were most decimated or the most organized. That were most decimated or the most? Were the ones that were most organized because it's hmm. easier to go in to infiltrate and take care of that versus the ones that were like, you know, not as. Uh, uh, together, oh, you're not taking mm -hmm. them. They're, they're rebel rousers. They're gonna they're gonna fight back a little bit harder than the ones the civilizations are much more organized. So historically, we don't usually think about that. Is it organized? Is it organized in the sense of you know just having organization? I would assume that all cultures have organization, or was it in terms of central government, a central yeah. governing unit? Where, for example, like because I can see that from a historical standpoint. Um, of having like a central king who makes all the, you know, the major big decisions for which everybody follows, because that's how Islam penetrated mm -hmm. uh, in, into a lot of spaces in Africa. It's like they, they take the king mm -hmm. and then, you know, because that person has uh, authority uh, and produces an edict. Now everybody has to follow this particular paradigm yeah. and then your 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 civilization is gone in no time so mali sungai timbuktu so all those <laughs> in ghana yeah when well, you had that kind of environment it probably made it easier for them to be infiltrated and the people to be taken so those places where people were taken now it's like guess what they don't trust and it goes a long way because again you're talking about family lines that sold people they were the they were the slave raiders I so we have all those oh man I hope I have uh, that video saved because I, I, I posted it on my Instagram. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, if I don't have it still, I'll, I'll share the link regardless. Where there's a, it's, it's, a, it's an African uh, elder giving a talk, like a TED talk. And, and he was talking about African people don't trust government. Mm, like yeah. that was his, his, his central talking point. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. But that, that's, that's, so I'm saying, I'm reading it from a epigenetic perspective in science. You have it from the historical perspective, knowing that what the culture and the science and, and, and what it was like. So tying it together, it makes sense. And also the term, you ever heard of African fractals? Yes. Yeah, so Ron Eaglish wrote a book called African Fractals, but talking about how with all our designs from the braids to the way that some of the communities were developed uh, to just whatever we do, there's organization in how we operate from the kitty cloth, mm -hmm. there's organization in all that we do. So I'm saying that that is then the, the uh, manifestation of why collectivity is so important because everything is now together. That's how we yeah. operate. Well, I know we can continue on for a very long time. And before we go, I want to make sure that, you know, people uh, are able to, you know, kind of look you up and and, and get more uh, information from you, especially your, your text. So mm -hmm. are you on social media? like that can they reach out or is there how how would you prefer if someone has more questions to to get in contact with you well i mean my my um i guess you'll be able to post it later on but the yeah. website for my material is drtmore.com so basically drtmore.com uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh my social media i mean if you want to contact me by uh, i'm on facebook or email uh uh dr timor online at gmail.com i'll send that to you so you can be able to post that but primarily i don't do too much of the uh instagramming and the uh social media it's different it's different or it's different uh time frame and that's where people are now where you are right <laughs> I, I much respect to you for taking to another level i'm trying to ride out the career you now building and creating <laughs> more so pretty much Indeed. if you want to see the books uh you can communicate with me via that particular uh website and also like i guess in my uh, uh i respond to you via uh email uh it's on facebook but again i i don't i don't know uh, unless there's some opportunities like this I have, I have a youtube page you know dr timothy owens more you can see some of my videos and like i said most people know how to push the button yeah. and find people now so Indeed. make sure you find t owens more versus timothy more there's too many timothy moores out there <laughs> indeed well this is um showing or sharing the screen of the website right now and so you can get um we i show him one of his books but as i mentioned there are a variety of texts dark matters dark matters dark secrets the science of melanin i'm seeing the spotter fly proverbs clue seeker and there are some more i saw at the bottom here maybe the same ones uh on this one's why dark matters and but you know you can get the books directly from him on this uh website which is the drt more uh dot com and which you should see on the bottom of the screen which is there yes it is yes and um so is there anything else that you want to say that we uh, haven't must, covered before we not so much uh, covered this? much respect to you for giving me the opportunity to speak before your audience and uh again develop the relationship that we've had again we chopped it up from the very beginning you didn't see my lecture i didn't see your lecture but we're on the same <laughs> path about what we need to be yeah. doing to get our people's minds right so much power to you indeed indeed well um i do appreciate each and every one of you for watching so make sure that you uh, again visit uh, drtmore.com to learn more about our special guest and um, and to support and purchase a few of the books that he has and we'll keep the conversation going so we we'll definitely have to uh, get him back and we'll speak more specifically 
you know, about something. But before you go, what what do you got going on in the in the future? What what should we expect? Uh, coming well, if you if you look when you look at uh get a chance to read uh, why darkness matters, I have a new mm-hmm. chapter in there, and so does Doctor Bynum. But I'm talking about what George G.M. James spoke about in Stone Legacy, chapter mm-hmm. five. Now I got the old school version here. Pages mm-hmm. all falling apart. <laughs> but then the it other is. version, I mean, you know, got several versions of Stone Legacy out there. But the chapter that he's talking about with Democritus, one of these particular philosophers, you know, those Greek philosophers couldn't have had all the answers. They got it from somewhere. Mm-hmm. He's talking about fire atoms. Hmm. Fire atoms back then. To me, yeah. as I talked about in chapter five, fire, ad- fire atoms are their conceptualization of what we talked about as melan- melanin today. Hmm. So I don't want to just focus on the skin, but I'm talking about soul and spirit. Hmm. Because our bodies are nothing but vehicles for the soul to travel. You start now Hmm. putting perspective, you now start to think about what our ancient African ancestors did to build those pyramids and those temples and all that they did out of stone. And here we can't do none of that today. They were moving on another level. So I'm going to talk about a new term I'm going to use to uh, redefine the word melanin. Hmm. All right, and look forward to getting into that text. Yes, and uh, I don't, I don't so know if I want to see what the word is right now because I, I, uh, yeah. I presented last week uh, uh, at the, Mel- at the uh, Associates of Black Psychologists to get approval from my elders to move forward with this because you know how I ran a certain book, Egypt Revisited. Yes, Melanin Revisited. <laughs> so the, the term, uh, should I say the term or I'll come yeah. back and talk, talk about it? What you want me to do? Should I say the term? No, I'll keep them keep them okay. keep them guessing for a bit. Right. I, don't, I don't want nobody out there trying to take your stuff and, and, and your stuff ain't, ain't published out there just yeah. yet. Yeah. You know, so uh so spoken yeah, like we'll, a true we'll, scholar. <laughs> you know, because people will take your ideas and and not have the full conceptualization of what it is and just use terms you want to make sure that your stuff is out there fully so when somebody is misrepresenting it yeah we have the source out there that we can say no that's not it he got that from him and this is what he says uh in this in this particular text and it has happened so you know the story (laughs) indeed well um, i do appreciate you again um for for this interview and uh look forward to having you back you know, on the program. All right. So, uh, summer, brother. Until, enjoy uh, enjoy the summer. Said, we'll do. We'll do. And, right. I, and I know you're traveling, so I'm trying to be like you when I grow up. All so right. I can, uh, be in South America. Uh, All right. Soon, you know, indeed. Uh, until next time. Until All right. Time. Peace.